been acting like a wild man, sleeping like a child. You're so luminous and vibrant. I'm always in bloom for you. Always in. Hello, and a warm and tender welcome to you all. Thank you for gathering here for another episode of the Ancestral Craft Podcast. It is an honour to be able to share a small part of a big life with you. Since we last spoke, seasons have come and gone, as fleeting as the blossom being carried in the blustery Scottish wind. We've seen the end of winter and the hinterland in between, followed by the wondrous awakening of spring. The moon has waxed and waned, tides have moved inwards and outwards, and I have been delving into cold waters with tingling hands and toes. The transition into spring has always been a difficult shift for me, and craft has been a steady hand to hold as the energy of the growing season starts to grow. I deeply look forward to catching up with you as I share with you my crafting practice. In this episode, I'll share with you what's been happening in the garden, some knitting projects, my ever deepening spinning practice, and what's been in my dye pots. So settle in, connect with a warm herbal drink, and as it nourishes you through its healing wonders, I hope my words and craft can heal your heart and inspire you to dream of creating a world that holds you. In the open air. Spring started to rub the sleep from its bleary eyes with the display of the snowdrops. There are always so many where I am. A wondrous woodland delight. When the snowdrops are in flower, the crocuses are never far away. Dear friends, with one nodding its head to the ground and the other staring straight up at the sky. The hellebores share their love for staring at the soil with the snowdrops. What you might think are the petals are actually its sepals, attracting pollinators whilst sheltering the flower from the cold and wind. I'm always amazed by the creative adaptations of early spring plants that allow them to survive in the cold.
With March came the rain, dreary and bleak. The sun hid its face for a little while, which gave me time to settle into my new job. Over Christmas, I got the news that I'd been offered a head gardener position at Granton Castle Walled Garden, a medieval walled garden here in Edinburgh. It's a community space that seeks to provide organic produce to the local community whilst creating a sanctuary for both people and all of the wildlife that also call it home. I've been so welcomed here and I'm already planning what we can do to further heal this historic piece of land. This is my first time running a kitchen garden at this scale. We have so much wonderful produce that I'm excited to grow. Pumpkins, peas, cabbages to courgettes. It would be so wonderful to document this growing season to share with you all. Most excitingly, I will be growing flax this year to try my hand at processing and spinning the famous golden fibre. The plum and cherry blossom appeared in the early days of April, soon to be followed by the apple blossom, which still makes my heart flutter as if I were a flower on its branches. I'm always left in awe by the swiftness of spring, the strengthening shades of green, the flowers which race their way up through the forest floor to see the sun before the trees start to break into leaf.
every day brings dramatic change. And like the birch signaling a new beginning, I feel myself turning the page to a new chapter. in my hands. Over the Christmas period, I set myself the task of finishing all of my outstanding works in progress. Spending days with my family, knitting on mittens, a jumper and a cardigan. It took time to finish the various projects, but I stayed true to my mission. In early February, I was working on my very last work in progress, the Macher Cushion. Then, just like that, everything was finished. The dreams of what I could knit next started to appear, and in a twist of fate, I had an accident at work whilst pruning apple trees, which left my left thumb out of action for a few weeks. In this time, I decided to go through my stash and clear out my crafting corner, following my impulse to reflect on my practice. It felt like a weight was lifted. I realized that my creativity flourishes when I can dream up a project from raw fleece to finished garment. I rehomed the wool that I knew I wouldn't use and filled two small boxes with what was left. Looking through my gathered collection, I could see what colours I truly connect with and it helped me understand what I deeply love to work with. My new goal is to knit through two large projects worth of yarn, which I had always had projects in mind for, and continue riding the wave of completing projects that have lingered for too long. The pull towards the outdoors came as a swift tug towards the sea, a deep longing to feel her shocking icy waters. I had found myself walking around in a daze and I needed help grounding myself back into the earth. Nothing is quite as grounding as cold water and I spent a beautiful morning watching the sun rise and immersing myself in her depths. I heated some porridge on the shore and I warmed my hands up with layers of knitwear. This led to the realization that I wanted my practice to be so tangled with the earth that I wouldn't be able to separate them, to knit more out of practicality so that I can be at one with her, making bags to forage in the woodland, 
make jumpers that are designed for collecting shells on the shore, weaving bands to tie my hair back as I climb a mountain, to merge purpose with beauty as the earth so wonderfully shows us every day. Let me show you what I've been tinkering away on. Welcome to the fibre portion of this podcast. You'll see that things are a little bit different format-wise this time. I've decided to change the podcast just a little bit. So instead of having a full uh, hour podcast where I talk to you from start to end, I'm going to be sharing clips from the past few months and narrating in a diary style format. And I hope you really like it. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is just thank you so much to my patrons who really allow this to happen. Editing like this takes me a lot longer and it means that I take longer between shooting so that I can have a beautiful story to share with you and I can reflect on the things that are happening in my life. And it really brings me a lot more joy this way to focus not just on uh, what I've made, but why I'm making it and the themes that are coming up in my life. And that way, when I look back, it's a beautiful story of, you know, the ups and downs of my journey. So the first segment will be the knitting segment, what's in my hands. And I've talked to you a little bit about my process of going through my stash and kind of reconnecting to what my practice means to me. And I just wanted to take this moment, even though I've said it before, uh, that everybody's practice looks so different and describing my relationship to having um, lots of stash or, you know, why I make things or making things uh, in moderation, it's never ever to judge anyone else and how you choose to make because the impulse to make is a beautiful thing to treasure and I would never judge anybody else's practice. But I want to, you know, come to you from a really authentic place and share where my thoughts and feelings go. And yeah, I think that's what people appreciate about what I do. So I think that's where I'll focus more of my time now. So now that that little uh, disclaimer's out of the way, I'd like to just jump into what I've been making that I've uh, mentioned in the intro. So like I said, over Christmas I uh, decided to finish up all of my whips. So I'm going to quickly go through them and show you them and I will talk about the yarn I've used but I'm not going to go into detail about needle sizes or anything like that. I really just want this to be a little journal to document what I've made and if you have any questions as always I will answer them and I will have the show notes as always where you can find more of the details. So I will start with uh, these interchangeable mitten liners and these were the first things I finished over Christmas, maybe I'll hold them this way. And these are made in Trava and wool, and it's her merino, cashmere, and silk blend. And it's a very thin wool, and I spoke to you about it in the last episode, but I've held it double here. And I went for a blue, and I think uh, the sea and the colours of the coast have really been inspiring me recently. And I just really connected to this blue, and it kind of inspired a more muted and uh, colder color scheme to my work. So I finished these and these were a beautiful knit. These were uh, an Emily Foden pattern in her Knits About Winter book. And I designed, I didn't design them, I <laughs> made these with the intention of making the Persephone mitts which are also in the Knits About Winter book. And um, these go together. Um, obviously I can wear them individually, but as you saw in the video, I love the way that when you wear these and you have your mitten on top, the blue still pops out of the bottom 
And I think it's just a really beautiful layering piece. This has a little pico edge and some beautiful lace detail on the side. And yeah, these fit lovely and they're perfect for getting out of the sea and putting on your hands and they really warm you up because there's so much space there to insulate and trap the warm air. So that was the first thing that I finished. The second thing I finished is what I'm wearing. So over Christmas, I had a little bit of work done on my soiree, which is also an Emily Foden. So I uh, went through that book and I was really trying my best to go through some of the pattern books I had and really appreciate the things that I wanted to make for a long time. And I got gifted this wool from uh, Melinda from Zakami Yarns. And also I bought the four ply that I held it with from Sue at Hawkshaw Sheep. And I've talked about the yarns previously and it'll be in the show notes. Uh, but I finished the soiree and it's really beautiful. It's a very simple construction, but the showstopper is all the detailings on the arms, the armholes and down the sides. So I'll stand up a little bit just so you can see. It's really beautifully intricate without it being too difficult. It's a really easy cable pattern to remember. And I really love it. It's very treasured to me. It reminds me of a mountain hair as its coat starts to change to white and it's still got some of those brown and violets in there. And mountain hairs are, are that I've always really connected to and yeah it brings me so much joy to wear it and think of the hair and yeah it's just wearing something that is reminiscent of something in the natural world really just helps you feel really connected to what you're wearing so I really enjoy it and then after I finished my soiree I finished my uh, Madeline jacket and this was a part of the Feather Friends make along, which is finished now. And the winner has been contacted. And I am in the process of painting uh, a crow. So the winner had made a beautiful uh, jumper that was inspired by the crow and all of the little treasures that crows and other corvids, they bring you as in return for food and treats and things like that. So I'll put a little picture of the winner. And this was just a random picker. It wasn't uh, because I liked this project the most. There was no favoritism involved. I loved absolutely all of the entries. And if you want to see what people have made, please look at the Feathered Friends make along hashtag. So it's a beautiful uh, warm brown cardigan and um, jacket really. And I've worn this a lot since I finished it. It's been a couple of months since it's been done. And it's been really great in the spring as a transition piece. So I can wear this when I'm working. And it's just really the perfect temperature. So it has a beautiful yoke with these slipped stitches and then some bobbles at the bottom. And I've explained to you in a previous episode that this was inspired by the female blackbird and how when you rake or you come out after the rain, they come out and they snag all the little insects and worms that you've unearthed. And yeah, that this pattern of the yoke really reminded me of rain falling and of raking through the soil. So I'll put this on for you so you can see. Um, I don't have any pictures of me wearing it, but I will show you. And I just used some very simple brown buttons. And the yarn is Caithness Yarns um, in their alpaca and castle milk moret. So it's a really lovely construction. It's quite a boxy fit at the bottom but it's got balloon sleeves and it might be pilling a little bit, but I'll, I'll button it up just a little bit so you can get the fit. 
So it's a really, really dense fabric. It's a iron weight yarn and it just really fits really lovely. As well as being a really lovely design, I think it's really practical for what I'm doing. The sleeves, when I'm working, they come up to just above my wrist. When I'm standing up, they fit right at the wrist, so it's a really nice fit. But when I'm like digging or, you know, working with uh, plants or seedlings, it's, they ride up just enough so that nothing gets on my jacket. And if it was, it's brown, so it's the perfect color. I'm gonna take this off now because it's really warm. But um, yeah, it's really nice to have, you know, the hair and the blackbird and to really think about what I'm making and making sure that it fits me just right. And I'm not afraid to rip back and to redo things if I need to. So that was everything over Christmas. I finished my mittens, my Madeline jacket and my jumper. The very last project that I made over Christmas, well, it was less so over Christmas, this was probably late January, early February, was I finished my Macher cushion and I am in love with this. This took a while. From casting on to casting off, it took me about six months. But I really just wanted to work on this when I felt like it. And it's a beautiful four-ply pattern by the Berlin Yarn Company using their bog cotton wool. And on the back, I just used uh, three buttons that I got from a charity shop and they're almost shell-like and they just kind of blend in but it really is a beautiful yarn that shows off this macher pattern work which is about the plants that grow on the macher in Scotland and this was my first time knitting a cushion cover but I just sewed up a cushion um, insert and filled it with some of my yarn scraps um, my wool scraps, sorry, from processing fleece. And this sits on my rocking chair in my spinning corner. So this is my spinning cushion and it's very precious to me, especially after all the time it took. But I would really recommend this pattern. It's so lovely. The only reason it took me a while is because it's charted and yeah, it really required a little bit of concentration from me. So it was more of a a row or two here and there every weekend, if not every week, one weekend every month. <laughs> so yeah, that's the Macher cushion. So after that, I decided to start casting on some projects that would use up yarn I had in my stash. And after knitting the Macher cushion, I really loved working with the bog cotton uh, wool from the Berlin Yarn Company. So I decided to cast on the kit that I bought with the Macher cushion of the Corp Song Shawl. And this is a design from the 52 Weeks of Shawl publication from Lina. And it's a very simple design. I'll put a picture of what the shawl looks like when it's finished. Um, but it features these uh, little eyelets which are reminiscent of crows flying. and. Corp song is Swedish and it means uh, raven song. So these are little ravens. And then there's a garter ridge that will be at the top. But this also uses the exact same yarn of the Berlin Yarn Company. And it's just a really springy wool that has a really crisp finish. And when you block it, it just is so beautiful. So this will really transform after blocking. It's hard to do it justice just at the moment, but it has a nice slip stitch design on the border. And on the other side, it just has a simple garter border. So yeah, I've just been knitting some rows here and there on this when I get the time. 
but I'm really falling in love with um, lighter colors. I just think all of the natural whites and creams are so beautiful and I really love seeing them. So hopefully this will be done soon. I have three balls left of the bog cotton and then that's that out of my stash which is really exciting. The second work in progress is the Felix cardigan and I decided to cast this on because one I've always wanted to knit the Felix cardigan because it's a really elegant and simple design but really I guess I'm in a bit of an eyelet mood. Uh, both of my works in progress feature eyelets. Um, I'm really loving just the texture and I'm knitting this in Manchalopi and this is left over in my stash from when I knit the library shawl by Heather Nolan. So Manchalopi is an unspun. Most people have been talking about this if you know podcasters who knit with unspun a lot. But I decided that I was in a bit of a blue-grey mood and I decided to knit myself this cardigan, even though grey isn't a colour I would normally wear. But I just really loved the way this pattern looked in this yarn. So I decided that two plates would be enough. And I think it will because this is still the first plate. And I'm on the body. I'm about two inches into the body. So... Hopefully most of that yarn will be gone by the time I finish this. But I really love the way it's working up and the colour brings me a lot of joy. So it's really just a case of working on these two until I finish one of them. And then perhaps I'll cast something else on, although I don't have any plans at the moment. So the last thing in the knitting section is to talk about a future project that I would like to make. I have dreamt of making a Gansey for a really long time and I got myself uh, the Gansey source book and knitting Gansies by Beth Brown Reinzel, I think her name is. And I found some Gansey wool when I was at the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase. And this again is by Caithness Yarns who's really doing some wonderful work and this is really not going to show up on camera because it's a very dark brown, it's almost peaty. Um, but this is his five ply Gansey yarn. Is that the right way? Yeah. And it's a really, really beautiful yarn and I can't wait to knit myself a Gansey with it. I got myself a cone and then a little bit extra just in case. And I'm going to make a very traditional Gansey in a very tight gauge is my plan and I'm going to design it myself, I'm going to try to, not for publication but just to, you know, have a nice creative project where I can learn how to knit a Gansey by myself. And I chose this colour, um, he had about three or four different colours but I chose this one because I think the main idea with the Gansey is that it's a working garment. It's meant to be very practical. And I am a gardener, so there was no point in me making a cream one or a light colored gray or something like that. It needed to be a darker color. And I might lose some stitch definition because of that, but I think it will be worth it because it's gonna be so wonderful to wear in autumn and winter. So I haven't decided what the yoke will be. All I know is that I'm going to make a kind of loosely, well, tight fitted, but enough so I can wear another couple of layers underneath. And then I want it to be three quarter sleeves to keep uh, the end of the jumper away from my wrists. So in the autumn, when you're wearing gardening gloves, if your gardening gloves are in contact with your jumper, it kind of, and, and it's a wet day and it's rainy, it will start to kind of bleed into what you're wearing underneath and get your arms wet. So if my jumper ends around here, my gloves end around there, 
then the idea is that it's going to be really practical and it won't kind of get wet and that layer will be my main insulating layer. So I'm really excited to start that project. Uh, it's going to be very fun but it will take a while to design and then knit in a very tight gauge. I'm drinking a blackberry and raspberry oxymel diluted in some hot water that I made last year because I'm coming over uh, a cold at the minute so I haven't been very well <laughs> and I had my little injury as well so my knitting progress has been slow but I've been really enjoying spinning instead and I'll share a lot about that later. So that's everything I have in the knitting section and I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you for the spinning section if you decide to join. Connecting to spirit, spinning and dying. Connecting to spirit is such an integral part of my life, acknowledging the life behind everything I come in contact with, remembering that the wood of my wool combs was once a tree, the dye bath was once a plant that grew in the earth, the wool that I knit with was grown by an individual sheep, which I now have the privilege of using. It's so important that we never take our materials for granted. There is life to be acknowledged everywhere. Spinning and knitting are entwining and dancing so magnificently together. I find myself less inclined to knit with wool unless I've seen the intricate beauty and character of its locks. I've been transported back to being a little girl living on a farm. The smell of the sheep is full of nostalgia and wonder bottle feeding wee lambs and running around barefoot climbing trees. Everything is interconnected. A fleece is never just a fleece. It's a way to feel my roots deep in the ground, connected to all of the mycelium. I can feel the ripples of this life. Can you feel yours? My first project to share with you symbolises an act of kindness, an embodiment of being of the land, never having forgotten what it was and is to be wild. You've probably heard me talk about Sue, if you've watched my podcast before. I'm afraid her name will never be far from passing my lips, as her life deeply inspires me. I've always been welcomed into her home, feeling like a child in a sweet shop as she allows me to rummage through her fleece stores. Last autumn, I went along to her home with another dear friend, Rahima, and I fell in love with a speckled-faced Shetland Cheviot cross. That love deepened when I felt the beautiful locks. I always leave with full arms and an even fuller heart, being asked for nothing in return. I've been processing this gift from Sue and her sheep with utmost care and respect. My plan is to knit the Kerry Kyle blanket, so I set about making a sample yarn and a small swatch. I originally carded it up and made some roving, spinning an ambiguous DK weight yarn to then knit up. Once I'd finished my swatch, I realized that the woolen prep was too airy and that the definition was lost in the pattern. I switched tactics and started prepping a worsted yarn with my combs, which you can see me doing now. Inevitably, I lost some of the fleece through processing. However, I kept all of the shorter fibers and they now live in my macher cushion. It took me around one month of combing little by little to make my basket full of nests. 
it's definitely a labour of love to hand comb a full fleece. After prepping all of my fleece, I decided to take a break from the project to try some support spindles. I came across a video of Josefine Watlin, a Swedish spinner and educator, spinning by a river and I was mesmerised. I had a support spindle that I had never been able to figure out and all of a sudden, watching her hands draft and spin, it clicked. I picked up my spindle and spent a little bit of time spinning some dyed Shetland wool and I was hooked. In the spirit of being inspired by incredibly talented women, I delved into Lisa from Soulful Spinning's Winter Breed Study Series. Every week for 13 weeks, Lisa took a breed and spun a sample on her spindles to then knit a square for a blanket. I was enamoured by Lisa's knowledge and dedication to becoming a true master of her craft. I looked in my spinning basket and brought out some blue tessel raw fleece. Blue tessels are a breed from Tessel, an island off the coast of the Netherlands. Its parents are Lincoln and Lester Longwells crossed with the native sheep on the island. They are quite large sheep which are raised primarily for meat production. Their wool is often overlooked. It's an honour to work with their wool. The crimp and elasticity is otherworldly. I think their wool would make wonderful sock yarn. The blue tessels are recognised as a separate breed to the standardised white wooled tessels by locals. I had a small bit of both colours in the fleece, a lighter blue-grey and a warm brown-grey. I combed them into nests and I've been spinning them separately on my new Crivelli spindle. I'm slowly teaching my hands the motion of spinning on a support spindle. Soon this will feel as easy as breathing. Feeling rejuvenated and bright-eyed to all of the new spinning possibilities, I returned to my wheel to start spinning my Shetland Cheviot Cross. To accompany my spinning, I sat with Sarah of the Fibertrek podcast, watching her hand-stitching the most beautiful quilt that captures the moon phases into fabric. I've been pondering making my own quilt for a while now. I just needed to find some fabric and the inspiration. As usual, my inspiration came from the plants and the beautiful dye work of Isabel Spence, a dyer and forager based in England. I began with some dried heather that I had from last year and I modified some dye baths to achieve different colours. I wish I could send the smell to you as it simmers away in the kitchen. The heathland is so evocative of Scotland. I thought back to the 8th edition of the Making magazine, which was titled Forest. In its pages of wondrous projects from hand-stitched mushrooms, shawls which mimic the rings of life within a tree, and oak motifs on beautiful knitted jumpers, there lies a hand-stitched quilt by Maura Ambrose. This is the inspiration for my quilt, 
Following this pattern, I aim to spend this growing season collecting plant material and dyeing strips of fabric in varying colours. In the autumn, I will sit by candlelight and endless cups of tea, assembling my quilt and hand stitching it together. By winter, I will have a beautiful reminder of the abundance of the natural world, being held tightly by all of the plants that I love so tenderly. A project that is now out of the dreaming stage and into the land of beginnings is my bowline wrap by Lindsay Fowler. I found this project in the pages of the Salt and Timber book, which was gifted to me at Christmas. As well as receiving the beautiful book, I also received an alpaca fleece from my dear sister, a delightful muted caramel which washes to a light beige. I immediately imagined this fleece being turned into the large wrap. I knew that I would want to blend it with a wool, and I dabbled with the idea of buying prepared top, but in the end decided I wanted to process the whole thing. So I set about trying to find a fleece. I was on the lookout for something of a similar staple length and colour, whilst having a softness that would complement the alpaca. My answer came from Fernhill Fibre, a regenerative farm based in Somerset. Fernhill Fibre is unique due to its use of blade shears instead of electric clippers. The blade shears allow the shearer to leave a coat on the sheep, which is beneficial not only to the sheep, but also means that the quality of the fleece for the spinner is a lot finer. Their specialty is Shetland Cross breeds, and I managed to get my hands on a Shetland Cross Romney fleece, which suits my alpaca perfectly. My plan is to prepare both fleeces individually to then make a worsted comb top blend with a 60-40 ratio of wool to alpaca. I can't wait to see how this project develops. It will be my first time making my own blend to spin from. Working with raw fleece is such a grounding practice for me and it really is becoming the heart of my crafting practice. I really look forward to sharing what I learn and getting to know this craft more intimately. Thank you all so much for sharing this time with me. It truly is an honour to be surrounded by such a wonderful community of people. I would really love to know what you've been reflecting on in your own crafting practice and what's been inspiring you recently. And as always, the show notes will be available on my website. And if you would like to come along to the Ancestral Craft Retreat 2023, details and tickets are available there too. I'm sending so many warm wishes to you all, and I wish you all tender moments with the earth.